Hey folks, welcome back to Homegrown. We're here at Sealock Incorporated right here in Rapid City, South Dakota. A lot of folks may not know what Sealock is, but it's a global leader in some emerging technologies that's helping the agriculture industry. Let's go ahead and find out what they all do. We're here at the manufacturing, the facility for Sealock Incorporated with Jeff Clark. Why don't you give us just a brief interview of what Sealock is today? Coming into this as a producer, you know, my view of Sealock is that we're working towards providing the tools necessary to cattlemen um, and really any uh, ruminant farmer or rancher, whether it's sheep or goats, we're providing the tools now. Uh, to help these folks stay relevant in the industry, to help them stay profitable, to help them become more efficient, um, and also um, document where we're really at. So that way livestock can really be judged and supported for what we provide right. um, to this situation and, and right. to the sustainability um, right. you know, of the earth versus kind of penalized for what is assumed. Um, and I love being a part of that because, you know, coming from the commercial industry into this, um, there's a lot of uh, notions uh, in the industry that we pollute more than we kind of provide right. um, in regards right. to carbon sequestration and those things. And we have the data that shows that's just not the case. Talk just a little bit about, you know, maybe how Sealot got started or some of the first technologies that they developed that, that are helping do that. Sure, well, we started in a garage. So Dr. Patrick uh, Zimmerman, um, who is a CSU alumni, had some research work in Africa where he designed a system to capture methane from termite mounds. This evolved okay. into what we now um, offer today as our green feed product, which captures enteric emissions from, from ruminants. So um, it, he took that technology and basically just worked through animal behavior and what he knew as a range scientist uh, to adapt that to collecting this out in the field. Um, and so the neat part about this is we can now capture that in real world management scenarios. Instead of taking these cows and putting them in the, the bubble chamber, right. it's out in the feed yard and out in the field. So that technology is basically something that can measure the CO2 emissions from cattle when they're out being cattle. Absolutely. And, and I mean, that's, Again, that's one of the things that we hear a lot about negativity in the news is that cattle are ruining the environment with their CO2 emissions. And we can argue all day long on that, but if we don't have the technology to measure it, it's just anecdotal evidence, right? So that's now exactly we're actually right. getting some technology and we're getting it out there where we can really have some hardcore data on that. Absolutely. We need to encourage farmers and ranchers to adopt technology that are going to maintain their long-term profitability. I was a commercial cattleman before working for this company and I chose to come here because they are the global leader in efficiency. I wasn't making that move so that way I could save the world from reducing emissions. It was to help farmers and ranchers become more profitable. The cool thing is the offset of that is we're actually selecting for cattle with reduced emissions right. and it's helping everybody. We're here with Dr. Patrick Zimmerman of Sealock Incorporated. And if I'm not mistaken, you actually grew up right here in Rapid City where Sealock is. I grew up on a farm. Okay. I grew up in Eastern Washington on a wheat oh, farm. Okay. But uh, I came to Rapid City as a professor at the School of Mines. Oh, okay, sure. And uh, I led the Department of Atmospheric Science and the Institute of Atmospheric Science. Okay. I was there for 10 years. Okay. And then I invented something and started uh, working with another company to commercialize it, and I took that money and started this company. Okay, so, so that probably leads us right into the genesis of Sealock in general. You came up with an idea to start measuring some emissions, is that correct? So yeah, I, I was a farm kid. I have a bachelor's degree in essentially zoology, a master's in atmospheric chemistry, air pollution research, and a PhD in range science. So I'm okay. kind of a Kind of all over the map there. Yeah, but I, I my PhD work focused on how to measure the exchange of heat, energy, momentum, trace gases between biological systems in the Earth's atmosphere. So okay. 
our atmosphere was created by biology. Right. And it's hard to predict, impossible to predict what humans are doing to change the atmosphere and unless you understand the biological cycle. Sure. So I thought, you know, what we really need is a standardized system that people can use to measure uh, accurately all over the world and compare results. Because I knew that methane represents an important energy loss from cattle. Sure. So it's an important greenhouse gas. It's 25 to 30 times more potent than than CO2 in the atmosphere. It lasts a long time and uh, um, and so it traps heat in the lower atmosphere in ways that can affect climate. And I knew that that would probably become a target, but the fact that it's also an economic loss, it's draining away five to 15% of the energy that could be right. going into meat right. milk production. Right. I thought that's a great target. Yeah. We, we can help farmers make money by knowing what's going on and uh, we can help them reduce their environmental footprint, but they gotta be able to measure it. Right. And so I'd been involved in measuring lots of stuff. So we developed some of the first measurements in the field uh, of emissions from trees. And in fact, Ronald Reagan's killer tree stuff, he was referring to my research. <laughs> That's when I was in my early 20s. I wasn't old enough to rent a car, but I was successful in writing research proposals and got that funded. And we, we found that trees emit a lot of gases that affect the atmosphere in ways that if you don't account for them, you can't control pollutants. You can't measure it, you can't improve it, right? Right. We started about 2010 or so okay. in that range and I thought we knew how to do it. We did some preliminary measurements with a big company in Europe and they looked at the data and they said, oh, it doesn't work. And I could see and Scott, who's really good at mathematics, that it actually worked really well. So we were encouraged. and. Uh, we didn't have money for a lot of prototypes, but the first one we built worked. And so we built the first one and tested it in a local ranch. And, and you built that first one in your own garage, is that yeah, correct? In a, in a garage. Yeah. It, we built the first one, we gave the second one away. The next one we sold to New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And uh, they worked. In fact, some of the early ones are still running. That's awesome. Now we sell in 42 countries. Uh, big companies, uh, some of the names are proprietary, but right. they're companies that you know all, yeah. all over the world are using them yeah. to develop cattle that are more efficient, sure. that have better genetics, that and feed that produces more meat and bone per calorie and feed additives that reduce methane so that you get better gain. So it's used for all of those things now. Animal agriculture has been built on the premise that if you can take a big cohort of animals and you can treat them as a unit, you can inexpensively move them through the process. Okay. But what happens when you do that is you don't have individuals. I mean, and they're all different, even though yeah. they may be from the same sort of batch. Almost the exact same genetics in but some they, cases. Yes, yeah, some of them require a little different feed. And our premise is that if you can have mass agriculture, but treat each individual animal, optimize their production in an automated way, you can make yeah. money and uh, save on feed right. costs. And So let's talk a little bit more about that. So you've, in the automation, you've gone from just measuring trace gas emissions to also now all kinds of different products and product lines where you're measuring other things, feed intake, feed efficiency. Talk a little bit about some of those things and how they developed. So 
we developed Green Feet first, and it has 18 sensors. That's what we're sitting by That's here? That's what we're sitting okay. by. So this can monitor methane and hydrogen. So if you're not producing methane, you got to get rid of the hydrogen equivalents or the acidity somehow, okay. or you'll kill everything in the room. And so uh, uh, if they're not making methane, they're releasing hydrogen. They consume oxygen just like we do. And if you monitor methane, oxygen, CO2, and hydrogen, you can tell, you know, it's like monitoring the engine on your car, okay. oil pressure, temperature, and sure. so forth. You can tell what the animal's doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the ratios of those gases change with the composition of the feed with the new, you know, genetics of the animal and right. so forth. So we did the hard thing first, and then we, we, in order to do it, we had to have a communication module to sure. take data and transmit it wirelessly to the cloud, to our computers where we process it. Right. We had to have um, sensors that, that monitored different components. It all had to be waterproof, solar powered, and so forth. So we figured, well, we can apply that technology to other problems in animal agriculture. So we started by building simple feed bins that monitored how much each animal ate. So it reads an ear tag and then it measures the weight of the bin. And then when they finish, it measures the weight of the bin again. And you know how much each animal weight and you can calculate then uh, how much weight they gain, right. and you can pick the most efficient animal. Yeah, I'd say, and again, so then we're taking, you know, animals, especially if there are seed stock animals that are in charge of reproductive for, for a lot of the animals, um, we can select the ones that are the most efficient. And if we aren't measuring those individuals, there's no way we can. No, you them. don't know. And in fact, we had us the sale and I, the details I may not have quite right, but the sale, the deal was that a rancher had six or seven bulls and he just needed one feeder. And the feeder was maybe, you know, several thousand dollars. He wasn't sure it would pay. Yeah. He decided to try it. So five of the bulls he sold for about 10,000 a piece at auction. The sixth bull had some desirable genetic traits, but it was also more efficient. It sold for over $100,000. And he wouldn't have known he had that bull right. without it. Even just the commercial cattlemen, if we can select animals, we can select bulls that then produce cows that stay in our herd that are more effective or more efficient. Um, you know, if we can save, 20, 25% of our hay costs. Yeah. That, that's the difference between making money and losing money in agriculture these right. days. It really is. And, it, and it's tough. It's tough out there for the commercial cattlemen to make a living. And if anything we can do to help them do that, at the same time improving the environment, uh, that's, that's great. That's so a great we have another product that's a big feed wagon. It'll hold several tons. It's solar powered, of course. And from all of our equipment, all the data comes back to us. Right. And Scott leads a team that processes that into useful information. A, f a farmer doesn't have time to right. do the math. He right. just wants to have the information he needs to make good management decisions. Sure. So we, we convert the data into useful management information. Yeah. Uh, but at any rate, so this feed wagon, you can fill full of any, like if corn's cheap, you can fill it full of corn. Almost every pasture, well, virtually every pasture is missing some key nutrient. So you can test to see what that is. You can add it in cottonseed meal or what sunflower, or whatever. And then you can, this feed wagon will deliver to each animal the exact amount of nutrient that it needs to optimize performance. And no more. And no more. It'll kick them out if they're trying to eat. They'll only, they'll read that tag, that animal will come in, get his tag read, yeah. said, you need X, Y, and Z today, and it'll give it to them. Yeah. And yeah, on the outset, I could see as a producer saying, that can't be cost effective. But once you start thinking about the savings that you might get. If you dump the feed on the ground, which is normal, right. you lose 25%. Right that the independent studies have shown that. With the tubs, 
uh, I saw a study, I think it was from SDSU, it showed that half the cattle ate twice what they should have, about half the cattle didn't eat any, but the average came out just right, so they thought they were doing great. But uh, so they weren't treating half of the cattle and they were over treating half and the tubs are expensive. So now we're here with Scott and Pat Zimmerman. It's now a family business. We've talked a little bit about how this thing got started as an idea, and then you bring your oldest son, Scott, in. Scott, just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be here at Sea Lock. Well, my uh, training is as an engineer, civil okay. engineer. Uh, I have a, a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and a master's in water resources and okay. hydraulic engineering. I actually worked uh, for uh, six years after school in the power industry. Mm -hmm. It was a great job and a lot of good benefits and uh, the power company was great to work for, but uh, one day Pat called and he had had an idea for a business. Uh, it intrigued me, so we talked more and more and I decided to actually come to Rapid City and start working with them on, awesome. on the business. One of the critical decision points that led to our success, and he's largely responsible for, was the insistence that the data comes back to us. If we had these as standalone units where- and Just here, good luck. Here it is, yeah, we'd be broke and people wouldn't be happy right. because it's, it's, it's a sophisticated system that, although we try to make it simple, the math's not simple. Right. And uh, it's amazing how difficult math can be for animal scientists. Sure. And so having us get the data means a couple things. First of all, if anything goes wrong, we know it usually before the operator does. Yeah. And so we can call them up and say, you need to fix whatever. Secondly, we can interpret the data and make sure that the quality control and quality assurance is done right. And I think we're one of the few instrument companies that we send out standards for the gases that are measured. So we have a global standards program, which means that if you make measurements in Australia or New Zealand or the Arctic Circle, you can directly compare them because we archive the standards here, we maintain a historical uh, sample, and we run everything before it goes. So a lot of that would then come back to your background yeah. in the atmospheric sciences. Yep. And the, the ability to do that, and again, like you said, not every producer can do that or has time to do that, but if you guys can take that data and digest it, and then send it back there to actually influence positive management decisions on the ground level, that's a win-win. People that are willing to learn are the ones that are successful. Uh, kudos to you guys for doing that. I learn something new every day and that's the fun Isn't of it. Is that the fun part? That's yeah. the fun part. I, I had someone tell me a successful meeting, you've probably heard this, if you meet one new person, you have one new idea, and you share one good meal, then you've had a good meeting. <laughs> but uh, uh, here uh, on the ranch, I learned that there's really smart people that just got out of jail <laughs> and, and that had a terrific idea, but they didn't have the drive or the money or the risk or whatever. And it never happened. And these people were working buck and bales for two dollars a day so i learned you can you can get good ideas anywhere and i learned respect is that's earned uh you know needs to be honored yeah. and uh both of my boys have my respect and in fact all the people here here you'll see the workmanship you were a shop teacher yeah. Yeah. We take a lot of pride in making things that, that, that will last and that will work. Uh, it takes extra, you, it, oh. takes my, it takes yeah. effort to do that. It's the same with new ag equipment. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows how to use it because they never had it before. Right. 
So we thought, let's give uh, agricultural researchers new tools and help them channel their thinking into how they can use it to do their research better. Yeah. So we started this grant program. It was hugely successful for everyone and has resulted in a lot of papers. We just repeated it this year. And uh, Scott, maybe you can tell a little bit more about the grant program. Uh, the, so the grant program is an opportunity for any entity, uh, whether it's commercial or research, uh, to apply for CLOC equipment. If the grant's funded, we provide the equipment and then they use our equipment to do new research, develop new markets mm -hmm. uh, that will be beneficial for the world, uh, but also beneficial for uh, for us and producers. So uh, we're look looking for uh, opportunities to partner with people that will think of new innovative ways to use our equipment. Our motto is we're not a manufacturing company, we're an idea company. Yeah. And so we need to keep the, the lifeblood as new ideas and, and the ability to follow up on them. And we need to harness that energy in the community around us to help them move forward as well. You know, at the time when we started, it was an idea. And, um, it, you know, I think one of the keys to our growth is listening to each other. Yeah. I mean, Maybe. I, yeah. he's, Pat's brought a huge amount to the table. You know, we, I have ideas. We have other employees that have brought ideas to the table that have helped us grow. And yeah. you just have to listen and learn and, yeah. you know, uh, build things together. I published over 100, maybe 150 papers. And those have been cited in the refereed literature well over 15,000 times in the top 1% of 20 million scientists. Nothing happens. Right. But this is gratifying because we're actually helping to change management on the range with real farmers and ranchers through solid academic research that depends upon our equipment to get the data. And that's been great for me. That's worth a lot to me. Taylorize Just as well as any